Tune in every Tuesday to the Learning with Lowell podcast with me, your host, Lowell, to hear world-class scientists, startup founders, CEOs, and authors, people who you wouldn't normally hear about but are making huge waves all the same. You'll understand them and their work by hearing their passion, laughter, advice, and hearing them, the experts, break down what they're working on so that you can learn, push the boundaries of your knowledge, and understanding. Three quick ways to show your support and get unique, exclusive, and fun content is by checking out learningwithlowell.com website, our Patreon page. Even if it's just a buck, it keeps us advertisement free and subscribing. Today we're joined with Gautam Dantes. He's a professor of pathology and immunology, biomedical engineering, and microbiology at the Washington University of St. Louis. He is the advisor to Chris and Nick who, of Viosera, who were on the podcast a while ago and, and are making an antimicrobial resistant technology. And in this episode, and really to enumerate on what Gautam is really great at is microbiology ecology so we really do get into that in the last half of the the interview but in the beginning we talk about his his, what the things he loves he you know his love of bow ties microbrewing gut biome celebrity microbiome cocktails book recommendations like those are all little samples of what we're going to be talking about in this episode the first question i ask him is where his fascination with bow ties came from as a fun segue let's get into this Something I'm always really interested in when, especially when someone's really into the sciences is to hear about the non-science things they're doing, or at least non-professional things they do that are, are, they're really passionate about. And so when I was reading about you, I believe that you're really into bow ties and home brewing. And so I'm curious, like what other things are you like a, a, like a a nerd to like an extreme extent that you wouldn't mind sharing? Yeah, I think you hit on two of them uh, already. Uh, There's, you know, sort of the broader aspects of sort of food fermentation uh, and drink fermentation. And uh, yeah, I got into bow ties in a pretty big way six or seven years ago. And in a sense, it's weird. Both of those things that I got super into are somewhat related to, if not science, at least uh, my job, right? And so the bow tie story really starts with the fact that back when I was still trying to be active, when I was an assistant professor, I used to bike to work, pretty easy bike route. It's about half an hour, about six and a half miles. Uh, And I got lazier and lazier in terms of not (laughs) changing into professional clothes, basically, (laughs) when I got to work. So I'd often still be in like workout clothes the whole day, um, which built me up a little bit of a reputation (laughs) says that guy. And uh, so as it turned out, one particular Friday, I was dressed up and it was not very dressed up. I had like a loose tie or something on. And uh, literally every single person in my lab was like, hey, Gautam, what's going on? Do you have to, you have to give a talk? Is there something? And, and in this case, I was still being lazy. It was just that I was supposed to go to the symphony that evening because my wife sings in it. And I just didn't want to change. Uh, so, uh, And I was like, I, you know, I was taking a little bit of back. And I was like, wow, I must really dress poorly most of the time. So jokingly, I suggested that I was like, maybe we should all dress up on Fridays. And I was surprised that about half my group immediately was like, yes, that sounds like a great idea. It's sort of the opposite of dress down Fridays or whatever it is, right? Casual Fridays in the corporate world. And uh, uh, one of my grad students, the way he you know, translated that was he started wearing bow ties. And I had sort of an, an, an aversion to bow ties at that point because I had sung in a uh, concert choir for all my college years. And we had to wake, wear those little fake uh, tuxedo bow ties, the clip-on ones, and I hated them with a passion. But this guy, you know, started wearing these cool bow ties, and I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll give this a go, and uh, sort of fell in love with them, with like, you know, the actually tied bow ties. Uh, and then um, when my wife noticed that, she started making me my bow ties. And so, and it's a long story, but that's how I got into them. And then, in fact, just <laughs> my my most recent Facebook post was about bow ties because. There's this this show that I think it's in its second or third season with Kristen Bell and Ted Danson. I can't remember the name. It's something about uh, oh the Good Place and uh, Ted Danson just has these badass bow ties that he wears on. So uh, and it was funny. I, I posted it and four or five of my friends immediately posted back like oh yeah don't you think the Peacock one is great blah blah. So anyway, so that's the bow ties. Right? Um, and uh, you know definitely it's fun to geek out on them and and in fact geek out even to the point where for a while I got. You know, sort of off the deep end where I was like, ooh, I should look at bow tie history and, you know, what war is bow ties over the years and how, you know, bow tie sizes have changed. And, you know, there was a period in, in like British history where uh, bow ties were like, like intentionally asymmetric um, and droopy 
Um, and then the style that I really like is this thing called the, uh, um, uh, it's 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 sort of diamond shaped. It's this double diamond, and so um, those are hard to get. But so far, my wife makes those, and so um, so so that's the bow tie story. On the other side, the cocktail making and and beer making and bread making again is sort of lab related because about a year into running my lab, I realized the ship had sailed of me ever really doing real experiments again. You know, that was no longer my forte. My lab was growing pretty quickly. You know, I was really going to be more of the person who to people and help with the interpretation of the ideas and running the lab, not pipetting anymore. But I, st- I, st- I started missing those aspects, right? I mean, I trained all my scientific life at actually being at the bench. And so weirdly, the way I decided to, to kind of go back to the bench was to you know, start brewing beer and baking bread. And, you know, that's effectively the only microbiology I could do anymore. But, uh, but I think, you know, coming from that background, it helped a little bit to say, of course, as a scientist, you'll nerd out and try to think of, oh, how do I make the, the, the next brew the most efficient that I can? And uh, it was also a lot of fun. I learned how to brew beer from my father-in-law. And, you know, we took a very scientific approach to it when I did my first brews. I was like, you know what? Until I feel like I'm comfortable with this, I'm going to take the same recipe and I'm going to make that same brew, but each time I'm going to change only a single variable and, and really make sure that <laughs> I understand, uh, you know, what I'm contributing to it. So, yeah, so we just picked this. You know, uh, um, you know, pretty easy IPA, and then kept varying like which hops were in there and which grain was in there, and like what the, you know, the the various amylase rest times, and so so that's super fun. You could I could still like science nerd out, but unlike any experiment in my lab, which would basically kill me to to drink the products out here, now I got to, uh, you know, uh, imbibe at the end uh, when whether there was. Again, the the, the 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 brewing or even with the cocktails, obviously I'm not distilling any alcohol at home, but it's fun to go into the garden and grab various herbs and make extracts out of them and, you know, put them in atomizers. You can put them over. So, yeah, just, I think once a scientist, always a scientist. Yeah, I mean, as long as you don't ever get those wires crossed, you know, like you go back to the bench to help someone out. And you're like, oh, I, I get to eat this, <laughs> you know, as long, as long as you keep them separate. That's absolutely true. And, and it's kind of funny because there, there is a lab. This is an uh, amazing microbiologist who we we did our postdocs around the same time in Boston. And now uh, her name is Rachel Dutton, and she has her own lab now in California. Her lab studies the microbial ecology of fermented foods, right? So, so she actually specifically studies from a scientific, from a microbial and a genomic perspective, how bugs work together or against each other to make blue cheese or to make kimchi or to make beer or wine. And I, I do sometimes think she really is, you know, t- training herself as well as all her trainees that hey, it's okay to eat the products that you work on in the lab. And so, you know, hopefully those people don't go into infectious disease labs and get confused. <laughs> yeah. The Do you think there's, there's, I think there's with a lot of the scientists I've talked with, they seem to, even in the things that they're, just kind of like the bow ties or home brewing they they seem to go to like that phd length of things like it's not just it's not just oh i want to know enough to appreciate it like they tend to want to like delve in into you know slowly manipulate the variables like you, you do with home brewing until you really understood it so i mean it's just an interesting observation i think i'm just kind of observing that you fall with within that uh pattern of someone who's like oh you know i want to really understand something versus just you know maybe being a practitioner if that makes sense no, it, it completely makes sense, and I think it it allows other scientists who, who you do this with to uh, appreciate and have fun. But I can I can certainly say that it sometimes drives non scientists crazy, <laughs> to, you know, to say like, can't you just relax and have fun and enjoy this without wanting to understand every single aspect of it? Um, and uh, you know, I guess to each their own. I think I've realized over the years that, or at least maybe resigned myself to understanding that you know there's a pretty strong type A part of my personality. And hopefully that's helped with some of my science. And I can't help but have that translate into other things I do, right? And so certainly I try to be casual with, with things that I, I can be casual with. But some, you know, when I get into something, it's really hard not to try to attack it in different ways and appreciate it in, 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 in different ways. And fortunately, I have enough other nerdy friends who appreciate doing the same thing. I'm on the same team. It's I think learning is, is really enjoyable. I think I think perhaps like the reason why people kind of stop is it is hard to kind of like embrace that, that ignorance and like keep going through it. It's like, it's a very painful thing though. I don't have a PhD. So like you probably know more about like kind of like going to the abyss of that more than me, but I'm curious, do you have any, do you have any like art thing? Like you, you mentioned your, your wife was a singer or did symphony type work. 
And I'm curious, do you do anything artistic by chance? You know, I don't anymore, but but you're right. So I did mention, so my wife is a singer. Her We met in college and her uh, degree in college major was music, but that's actually how we met. We, we were both singers. Um, you know, we both sang in the, the this concert choir. And uh, again, it was it was musically a pretty nerdy pursuit, pretty intense. You know, we rehearsed every day uh, um, of the time that we were there. So the five days a week uh, for an hour to an hour and a half. Um, so, you know, in many ways, I was in that choir rehearsal room space on campus more than any place besides my dorm room. Right. Um, and um so yeah, I don't. I'm regrettably, you know, with running a lab and and how things have gone, don't sing anymore outside of you know to my kids. And uh, but yeah, so that that's the closest sort of artistic pursuit I'd say is I, I really loved singing. I, I still do. I don't do it. You know, I'm, I'm, my wife is a lot better than I am. So you know, my my opportunity to to be involved with singing, fortunately, is still to live vicariously through her. And she sings with the symphony chorus here with the St. Louis Symphony. And then she also sings with a couple of local opera companies. So I get to go and, you know, listen to fantastic music. Kind of touching back on your 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 bow tie, like being in good company. Bill Nye, he does like, as most people know, Bill Nye does education for getting people excited. And so if you have like a really good understanding of songs, you can make like cool science songs. Like there's this guy. Yeah. I think there, I don't know if you've ever heard of this song called, um, it's like by Bo Burnham where he says, "What's a pirate minus his ship? A creative homeless guy. What's yeah? <laughs> what's uh, I uh, no? What's something something something? I guess it makes it real. I don't know, but I I, I take it based on your responses that you know what I'm talking about. I totally know what you're talking about. I was also I, I actually thought you were going to go in the direction of this other guy who's you know become a little bit of a at least science nerd YouTube sensation. I forget his name, but um, uh, he did a. Uh, he does science songs and they're super well done. They're very informative to the tune of like the various pop songs. And the one that I think really got him on the map was Evo Devo. And he did it uh, to the tune of Despacito. Right? And uh, you should check it out if you haven't seen it because it's really, really good. Uh, the guy definitely knows, knows uh, his science and he's a wonderful musician. And it's kind of just fun to, I mean, it's so ridiculous that I, I listen to it so often as the Evo Devo version that my kids who are, who are five and eight, rather than sing along to the Despacito lyrics, we've been singing along to his lyrics for a while. It's, uh, I, I looked it up while, while you were mentioning it so I can check it out later. It's Acapella Science at YouTube that's for anyone who's checking it out. Yep, that's exactly right. No, he's, and he's wonderful. He always comes up with cool ways to, you know, to, to really get into this. Like, I think you can listen to that Evo Devo song and, and watch it and actually learn something about evolutionary and development biology, which is pretty spectacular. Maybe that'll be like a, I don't know, I wouldn't call it like a New Year's resolution because, you know, one, that's a couple months away and two, like they tend to fiddle out. But like, that could be like a new thing that you and your wife could do together. Like make a, like your own kind of, yeah. <laughs> I'd listen to it. I'd be like, number one, even if it's, I'd tell you if it's bad. Like, I don't know anything about song making, but I'm sure it'll be great. But the... I don't know. Like more people are getting excited about it, and I mean, imagine like your kids are getting excited about science, in a, in a way that you know I don't know. Maybe when you were a kid, I don't know if they were science education songs. I don't think so. But then again, not that I remember. I mean, I grew up in India. I don't really remember much about <laughs> much science exposure at all, um, at least in those early days. But but yeah, no, it is it is really cool, right? That you know you're using these various media that that you can relate to in a. In a you know, kind of subconscious level and it's education at the same time. So our other form of that in the lab is we make a new shirt every year, a lab t-shirt. And I think it also comes to the territory, as you were saying, right, with the, with the nerdiness is that the level of punning uh, is particularly high for some reason with science people. Mm -hmm. Usually they're pretty bad puns, but this is a fantastic website and app called Monday Punday. There's this guy who he started out as a comedian and every Monday has a visual pun and then you need to Try to figure out where it is, and I lab really got into it. And then, well, one of the ways that manifested is that when we make these T-shirts for the lab, quite often they end up being, you know, some sort of science pun. So, so I think those also, well, again, they're jokey and they they evoke the the humor aspects of and the camaraderie aspects of being a scientist. They also are teaching moments, right? So someone looks at it, and you're walking around, and someone's like, "Hey, what does that mean?" And you know, yeah, it's a, it's a joke, but they've also now suddenly been exposed to you know almost insidiously they've been exposed to science it's a, it's a good thing it's like um i guess it's not a good thing you could do it for evil things you know it's like slowly <laughs> isn't it like it's against the law to do subliminal advertising so it's kind of like that's like 
like uh i don't know if you've i don't this is like a horrible one a uh, family guy where the guy just keeps saying smoke i don't know if you watch family guy I, no i do okay so there's i like, haven't seen that episode but i think it came out like 10 years ago or i don't know it's been a while they're, they're still on there but the guy just kept saying smoke <laughs> it's just like really goofy but um you know in a positive way like i, I think that's good because it's like free advertisement it's like free walking billboard but that's exactly right that's exactly right um, yeah uh, just one one last kind of like uh non-science question but i i'm curious before we transition over but the what's like a, another kind of nerdy bow tie fact like i was i was very interested i'm always interested in here like esoteric knowledge that like like that so is there like one that like if you're at a cocktail party you made someone a drink that you normally tell people you know it's not tell people but i think the first time i was put on the spot mm -hmm. uh someone was like well how long does it take to, you know to put on your bow tie and i was like well now i can do it pretty easily but it was literally the first few times I was trying to do it and get it right. Like my shoulders started hurting because it was so hard to keep my hands in that particular position. I was like, I must be in such terrible shape if it hurts my arms to tie a bow tie. But it was just like it, it, it took like 10, 15 minutes to do it. And so and, and the you know, the the funny thing was there were like two or three other people around and they're like, dude, isn't that isn't that true? Like the exact same thing happened to me. Uh, you know, and so I'm glad I'm not alone in this. I thought it was a complete weakling that I couldn't have bow tie, but it was just, it's a weird, weird kind of knot and it's not something you're used to. But then what was cool about that is someone was like, well, so now could you, could you tie the bow tie, you know, without uh, looking at it? So could you do it like, you know, blind? And I was like, uh, I'm not sure, but it was kind of fun. Like, you know, I tried it and I did it and it's just kind of fun that that muscle memory comes back. So I guess, you know, that's not a true bow tie fact. It's more like a bow tie tying fact, but mm -hmm. It was neat to know that, you know, other people who I know, like when what has described this, the first experience when they started doing the actual hand tied bow ties, that uh, it's it's not a it's not an automatic movement that comes from anything else. Uh, but once you learn it, it's pretty easy. Bus member is kind of weird. It's almost like an alien sometimes where like, you just kind of get it's like when I first started putting contacts in, I, I swear I just spent like 30 minutes. And by the end of it, my eyes were like beat red. <laughs> And now it yeah, takes me like five seconds. Yeah, to be able to do it, right? Yeah, no, that's it, it's 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 cool. It's fascinating. It's of course it's frustrating while you're learning how to do it. And there are like you know, as an example, like I never got her over that. I I tr I've tried wearing contacts maybe three, four different times in my life, and I just couldn't get over the the irritation of putting them in. So I've just been a, you know regular eyeglass wearer. But it is cool when you get over that hump, and then you're like, well, I can't believe this ever used to be frustrating, and now I can do it you know literally with my eyes closed. So. I just remember there's one other question I wanted to ask you about what we what we were just talking about when you were like doing like the slow iterations of uh, microbrew and uh, not microbrewing but brewing. Where did you like learn any like neat techniques that way? Like, because I imagine I don't know how long you've been doing it. If you've been doing it for years and years and years, I imagine you've like learned some things using that like scientific iterative approach. And so I was curious, like uh, in, in gaming terms, it's kind of like min maxing, like how to get like the most for the for the least. Uh, but sure. Yeah. So did, have you found any like cool techniques like that? Oh, absolutely. And and honestly, that actually, <laughs> that's a slippery slope, right? Because the better you get at home brewing, the more beer you have to drink. And, you know, also I was trying to max out metrics. And so there is a, there's an official e efficiency calculation. And so there are calculators online that tell you for X amount of grain that you put in, you know, how efficient is your beer based on the total amount of alcohol you get at the end. But <laughs> again, that can be dangerous to do, right? So so there were definitely a couple tricks. And so, you know, there there are, and all, a lot of this can be just gleaned from looking at uh, people's recipes online. But, you know, the, the temperature and time that you incubate your, I just use incubate, that's weird. Clearly, I'm a nerd right now. That you <laughs> that you have your uh, your your mash, right? Your grain after it's ground. You know, the, the, there's there's all of these enzymes that you're trying to activate that are already in the the grain to start breaking down the sugars into your various mono and disaccharides. And so, by some trial and error, and from reading about different grains, that was a that was a cool thing to try to optimize to say, you know what? Now I understand why there's a 15 minute step here, a 45 minute step here, because it's going to increase my efficiency. And then the other thing also was to figure out, you know, that not all sugars are made equal. And so, you know, some people would consider it cheat, but there are there's definitely ways in which you can add very specific types of specifically unrefined sugars that you add into the, the mash. So you're adding more sugar in addition to your grain. Obviously, you can't cheat the, the calculate your efficiency there, but that again can pump up uh, certain flavors, but also the alcohol profile. 
you know, without at the same time uh, messing with the, you know, some of the calculations of the grain. So, so all of those things were, were, were kind of fun to figure out some trial and error and some reading about them. But I will say it's a, it definitely is a dangerous and slippery slope to try to get the most efficiency out of your beer, because obviously, you know, you should always be trying to also optimize for flavor and drinkability and safety, right? Because yeah, the other thing that when I got into to home brewing, I was like, I'm not going to mess around with bottling, right? It's just a pain that I've heard horror stories about, you know, contamination and just, the, you know, so I was like, I'm going to wait until I can afford to do my own kegging. But again, then you get into this stage where like you get really good at it. And now you have four kegs available for personal consumption in your downstairs fridge all the time. And, you know, <laughs> uh, and like, you know, that I was pretty proud when I was, I was beginning to clock in at like 13, 14% alcohol beers. But again, then you realize, you know what? Now what I'm doing is I'm drinking wine out of a keg. <laughs> 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 so uh, I, I definitely one of the things I did uh, to mitigate the situation is I invested in a lot of really small glasses, <laughs> so I could self-regulate a little bit. So the the process of adding sugar in, like different ref, uh, refined sugars in, reminds me. I, I grew up on a farm, just like as an asterisk for people who are listening in, and this is gonna be a farm parallel. But there was this person who. Uh, beans have like these ribosomes on their roots where they can make nat- nitrogen. If I remember this correctly, it's been a while since I read the textbook, but right. yeah. so, uh, okay, good. I remember it correctly. So one, one person was like, Hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to throw more nitrogen in the, in, in the soil over here, even though they already make it to try and like supercharge them. And so at first it did work like the first couple of months that it did su- supercharge the crops. But after that, they kind of wilted and died out and they kind of like, they sussed it out that it was basically the ribosomes never really fully developed because there was so much abundance in the environment. And so like, there wasn't like that natural, just like complete continue growth. It was just like a spike and then going down. And so I, I'm curious, like what, it, I guess what, or if a similar process happens when you add the sugar in, it, it seems like it doesn't. So it just kind of spikes it and then it keeps growing in that c- confined area. But yeah, I was just thinking yeah, about that. So- like, yeah, does that happen or? You'd have to add an incredible amount of sugar for it to really uh, kill the efficiency of the process, because really the only thing that you're killing efficiency-wise is the yeast that will do the final fermentation, right? So, you know, this is nothing to do with flavor profile, just in terms of, you know, could you add enough sugar in to actually crash the entire system so you don't get beer because the yeast die? But I think yeast, you know, their tolerance to sugars is pretty darn high. What's actually more of a problem in terms of the process, and this is something which I also played a little around with, is even though these yeasts are, you know, evolutionarily set up to convert sugars into alcohol and carbon dioxide, they do have a limit to their alcohol tolerance, right? So what could happen is if you add too much sugar in is the yeast will go until it makes a certain percentage of alcohol. And then after what after it hits that particular percentage, that alcohol will kill the yeast. But similarly to how alcohol is used as a disinfectant to kill bacteria, whatever it is. So now the problem you might have is that, you know, you go through some percentage of your sugar fermentation to produce your alcohol. And once that alcohol kills your yeast, there's nothing more to ferment the sugar. And so then you'll end up getting a sickly sweet beer. Yeah. Um, so, so in fact, this is something that people have, 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 again, figured out by trial and error, but now can really dial in is to say, you know what, if I do want a sweeter beer, One way in which to do that is to put a finite amount of sugar in and know what the efficiency of conversion and my alcohol tolerance of my yeast is and just know that after a while that yeast will crap out because it's and then the rest of the sugar is unfermentable. Another way to do it is to to put in sugars that are some percentage of your sugar that is not fermentable by that particular yeast strain. So you're probably familiar with milk stouts, right, Mm -hmm. A, a style of stouts. Uh, so in milk stouts, there's no actual milk in there because that would go, you know, go bad really uh, quickly. The reason they're called mi- milk stouts is because lactose is added in, right? So that's the primary uh, disaccharide in milk. So the, the reason that people like me are lactose intolerant is because of that uh, disaccharide. As it turns out, standard Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the fermentation organism for most beers, cannot break down lactose, right? But if you and I were to eat lactose, well, actually not me, but non-lactose and common people eat lactose, it tastes sweet. So that's a cool way in which you can say, okay, I'm going to take a normal stout and then add on some amount of lactose 
the normal start will have whatever normal sugars it has that the yeast will ferment over. All of that gets converted into alcohol and carbon dioxide, but the lactose concentration stays fixed because that's non-fermentable by that particular strain. And that's where you get that added sweetness that milk stouts have. So, so that was one way in which you know you can get around that. And that was a fun trick to figure out is you can dump a much higher concentration of yeast when you do your actual fermentation. And then what that allows you to do is eke out a little bit more efficiency because you're basically battling with the bugs that are in there, you know, going and effectively their last gasp before they die is to give you a little bit more alcohol efficiency. Um, so just by, you know, adding in 10 times, 100 times as many yeast cells, now, you know, just a few more of them will have a little bit more time to ferment. And so now you'll be able to take a little bit more of that sugar and ferment it over to increase the efficiency of your brew. So that's another kind of cool trick that people play with. And industrially, certainly that's what a lot of breweries do, right? Is to play with those balances so that you have the right concentration uh, and mouthfeel and flavor of sugar versus alcohol. I think this stuff is just really intense. The uh, While you were kind of explaining this to me, I was thinking like, who are the first people, you know, like the like tens of thousands, 10,000 years ago when we first made mead and, with beehives in Egypt, you know, like those people who are just slowly figuring stuff out, like, oh, you can eat this, don't eat that. Like the first person to figure these things out, like they must have been, you know, really gifted because it's like, like it, it, it's relatively e- uh, easy to like iterate like a helicopter, make it slowly better. But then it's it's much harder to uh, invent a helicopter. You know what I mean? So it's like, no, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know. It, it, it's just an interesting thing. I, I imagine you... Are you like a history nerd too? Like, do you ever like delve into like all the history of of brewing and like use that in any of your research or just like for fun? I do. I wouldn't say I've used it in my research per se, but certainly have used it to try to improve, you know, or at least play around with things like baking and and brewing. Again, I'm not necessarily one of those people who's going to take the trip out to uh, ancient Egypt or, or I guess modern Egypt and try to find the craziest sourdough start or anything like that but it's just yeah i agree it's just it's fun to figure out how much serendipity plays a role in in things that can be exceptionally transformative right and so i mean i've heard lots of anecdotes i think there are a few different theories about how various types of fermentation products came up uh, came about you know probably you know the uh, the first beer and bread was somewhere in between right it was you know some grains that were left out and they went bad and Probably someone spit in something, and so that added some inoculum, and then you had your first ferment, right? And so, and then someone by mistake maybe left it out by the hearth, and then it baked, and they're like, hmm, bread, right? And and then <laughs> someone else took whatever that broth was and drank it, and and who knows, you know, maybe that particular person was the only one who survived the bacterial contamination that was around because they had a little bit of alcohol. So anyway, a lot of the again, who knows whether any of these specific anecdotes or uh, or myths, if you will, were you know the the true origin story, but they certainly make sense intuitively, and it's fun to think that, as you said, right, that that original invention, that that original discovery, was something that was a huge leap from what people did before that, and now you know we have the luxury of being able to refine those particular processes, and 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 then the fun part as a scientist is to say. You know, you can not only, you know, respect how this came about and learn what the origin story is, but now perhaps also recreate it and tweak it and understand it and hopefully improve it. In history, there's a good like correlation where before up to this point, like to like stop getting dysentery from like drinking water. That was, you know, where the runoff would go into. We were drinking. Yep. We were drinking alcohol all the time. Uh, actually, Ben Franklin got a lot of crap for drink, like not wanting to drink alcohol when he was over in England. But so at this time, all of Europe, like even like kids were drinking alcohol so that they wouldn't die. And then all of a sudden, you know, from I think it was Saudi Arabia, we got tea, uh, Saudi Arabia or India, I forget where, but the we, we got tea. And then that was around where Isaac Newton started, you know, like Isaac Newton start, uh, people started like popping up and he, he went to tea houses all the time. And so you go from like alcohol to tea <laughs> and then you get like the reformation or, or whatever the yeah. historical context is which is just like is it there's a lot of things going towards it like an environmentally which is what, how we're going to segue into like my, microbial ecology but i always just think it's really interesting that we went from like you know anytime we got to more than like a hundred of us sitting in an area we would just like kill ourselves based on what we were drinking on accident to like having an alcohol as a good substitute to then having tea you know because you'd heat, heat it up and like kill the microbes and then eventually we had what was it lewis Pastier, yeah, 
Louis Pasteur, yeah, the father. I mean, that pasteurization is named after him, right? And so a lot of cool things came. Yeah, and and it's it it really is cool that the you know the history of fermentation in terms of both food and drink is probably responsible for many of the you know innovations in both diet as well as in medicine, right? Even if you think of you know, I'm, I, you know, I'll start with the segue. If, if you think about how antibiotics are made, right, that's a fermentation process, right? It's it's a microbial catalysis of you know a particular substrate. It's what they eat, and then one of the things that they produce out of that happen to be, in the case of antibiotics, these chemicals that you can use to cure infectious diseases. And fermentation product of Saccharomyces cerevisiae happens to be carbon dioxide and alcohol. And man, where would we be without our beer and wine and bread, right? Wouldn't be terribly interesting. And so, yeah, it just, it's, it's really, really cool that we're so intimately dependent on the metabolism of these microbes. And effectively, we're taking their waste products at some level, their byproducts of living and uh, using that for all sorts of benefit to us. My version, or like the thing I, I readily think of when people like you know byproducts of these creatures is like honey. Honey's bee vomit. <laughs> it's like, but it's delicious. It's, it's like, fantastic. yeah, it's like it's good for immune system. You know, keeps for a while, but it's bee vomit. You know, it's like they're like the little cows of the insect world. But I, I'm I'm curious. Actually, one uh, since the last time we spoke, I was in Boston. I was I went on uh, past year's street near the the Vis. And I was really surprised they didn't have like a giant cow statue or something or like a giant milk, like one of those milk cartons from like the 40s. And I, I kept I kept telling that to people and they were like, that would be a good idea. So I think we should maybe like, I don't know if that like sounds like a good idea to you, but, but we should try and get like a giant like carton of milk over there in, in no, honor of them. You know, so in fact, when I was in Boston, that that was I was in that building, that uh, 77 Avenue Louis Pasteur. I'd, I did my postdoc there, but yeah, I never thought of the fact that there was no there was no homage to the man who you know to really sort of the modern uh, contributor to, to to really help us understand so much about microbes and infectious diseases and 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 things like sterilization and pasteurization. So yeah, I, you know maybe I'll email George and suggest that um, he can he can petition for some sort of testament to. Pastorians, in addition to just the name, I don't. I think uh, George's George Church for people who are, who are listening in. I I think he has like a, a couple a couple of floors in his lab, or just one. I I got a tour while I was out there, and so I think he could just like put like a milk like a giant you know milk carton like on the outside of the window. You know, like some people put like a school thing. You know, like just little simple things. You know, and then if we get enough people in that building, eventually it'll just be a giant you know milk carton. That's like... That would be funny. And what I also like about that is it's sufficiently obscure that no one is necessarily going to look at a milk carton and immediately know that it's an homage to Pasteur. And I think, again, scientists get a kick out of the, you know, the sort of inside joke thing. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a fine idea. Are there things with microbial ecology that most people would be surprised to hear about or like that, like, you know, kind of harking back to the, the cocktail party, are the things that like you tell your friends that aren't microbial experts that like get them like, like wide eyed, like, oh God, is that, is that real? Well, honestly, even just the concept of microbial ecology is foreign to many non-scientists, right? Because think about what we are, are generally taught about microbes in school. Suddenly the you know, the, the heyday of the microbiome is changing this some, but, you know, I'd say, let's say mm-hmm. up to maybe 10 years ago, and I'd say still for the most part, you, t- you tell someone what their association is with the word bacterium or microbe, and it's something bad, right? We're, we're told to wash our hands so that the microbes are not on us and, you know, don't spread disease because they're carried by bacteria and microbes. And so one of the manifestations of that, and we can actually point towards Pasteur and uh, Cock of Cox postulates, you know, these contemporaries mm-hmm. from, you know, 120, 130 years ago, for giving us this kind of view of the microbial world as these single, solo bad organisms that cause bad things, right, that they cause infectious diseases, and really losing this, this concept that microbes are best described in ecological terms of living in community. And the weird thing is, this is not something that we suddenly discovered, it's something we had to rediscover. If you go all the way back to the the inventor of the microscope, right, the sort of grandfather, father of microbiology, this guy, Antonin Leeuwenhoek, 
crazy. He was not a trained scientist. He was just really, really good with his hands and made these incredible lenses and was able to amplify things that he couldn't see by the naked eye. He called what we call bacteria now, he called them animalcules. He has these beautiful drawings that he made of things that he found from all over the place, but especially cool, if you look it up online, are the drawings he made of things from scrapings in his mouth, right? This is before much good dental hygiene. And he described this, and he said, my mouth is teeming with animalcules. And he was just describing this purely at the morphological level. But clearly, the first guy to visualize microbes is already describing them in terms of complexity and communities. You know, that's why this, this, this concept of microbes living together with in, 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 in exceptional diversity, you know, that they're, they're, like, they're like forest ecosystems, but even greater in terms of diversity, is something I think a lot of people still don't just automatically glom onto, right? And that, that we still think of, I mean, again, if you if you Google image search microbiology, the, the things that you're going to find are Petri dishes with single microbes, right? Those are, that's the, you know, microbiology, that's the, you know, Petri dish with something growing on it is your standard description of microbiology. But in, in many ways, it's that, that gets it incredibly wrong, right? Those are just cases of us domesticating very specific microbes in a laboratory, right, in very artificial conditions. Think about how a standard microbiologist grows most bacteria. We put them in these, you know, these weirdly conical glass flasks, and then we shake them. Uh, and, you know, what what natural habitat does that ever describe, right? There's no bacterium whose, whose life cycle is sitting in a glass flask and being shaken around in this orbital fashion outside of these domesticated bugs. And so anyway, that's the long way of saying that I think the you know, still to this day, even, you know, even scientists who are not microbiologists, I, I think are still surprised to at least appreciate, maybe not, they're not shocked, not that they've never heard it, but I think to appreciate the fact that, you know, the lion's share, the majority of microbes on our planet, both good and bad, and most of them are good, or at least benign, live in these complex communities. And ecology really is the, the most natural way, the most useful way to begin to sort of understand and appreciate them. And then also, you know, in the cases of the ones that are bad, even even fighting the bad bugs, I would argue, is is improved as a process by using an ecological uh, view. Well, that that's something that I was really eye, eye-opening for me. I would talk to, I interviewed a lady named Susan Gruders, if I'm remembering her last name right, who did like 20 years of antimicrobial resistant advocacy. And she was talking about how instead of like kind of playing whack-a-mole with these you know big bugs like we do uh, you know antibiotic and then you know the the super ones that can potentially come from that and like trying to whack that next and then like we whack that one and then another one you know like basically playing whack-a-mole all the way up you can instead like try and get the ones that we can kill to be the dominant ones and then we would just be sicker for an extra two days or, or you know what have you it's just like this idea that you can use the microbes that we are able to defeat as a weapon against the microbes that we can't defeat you know so like using like it all together instead of just you know maybe you know anti you know like a machine or like something that we developed which i think is like a, a trend that i've noticed in in my research the last like 20 30 years we're using more like nature in relation to how we develop things versus just m- man makes something that is the best way to you know that is the best thing it'll you know do the job where like you know the the nature has ha- has had what like two billion years uh, of select you know like working its way down and so we, we can kind of like take that and like use it that was just very eye-opening to me like i never thought of that as like using the ecology and, and the environment and all the other microbes as a tool to fight like these really infectious things but- yeah and and the thing is that 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 particular analogy can be appreciated at multiple scales right and exactly you gave a perfect example of how by thinking about community structure and by thinking about who's there and who might you want to have around as the dominant bug you can kind of you know again don't put in the selective pressure of wiping all of the you know weak and semi weak guys out so that the only one who survives is the really hardcore guy and now that guy happens to be resistant to everything you have and then game over right Instead, if you can manipulate the, the ecosystem, right, the, manipulate the community so that you use the rest of the bugs to suppress the bad guy, and then, you know, you don't have as much of a battle to wage. So, so that's, you know, that, that, again, this is what I said, that taking that kind of approach can, can really transform the way that we consider microbes, both in health and disease, right? That there is a, 
that that we're learning from nature, as you said, that things you know live in these dynamic communities, and what can we learn from the principles, or what can we learn about the principles that govern those interactions, and then use that really to to control microbes in a very different way, right? And then secondarily, I mean, and I think sort of equally so, another perspective that comes from again appreciating the this natural ecology is, as you said. Kind of the, the biodiscovery aspect, right? That one way in which to find the, the next set of biologically derived or inspired molecules is again to look at the the, the natural interactions that, that occur in microbial communities. How are microbes talking to each other? How are they controlling their own populations? How are they controlling neighbors versus competitors? Uh, how are they doing that over time? And you know, if we learn to if we learn that language, now we have access to a much greater suite of tools potentially to manipulate those particular interactions, right? So if we find that, you know, in a sense, if we if we think about it, truly that's how antibiotics were discovered, right? That you know, outside of the serendipitous discovery of penicillin, you know, by Fleming, when people start thinking about you know what was actually going on and what we've learned over the last hundred years or so is right. There's just this very specific group of bacteria which dominate. The, the 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 type of molecules or, or they're they're the major clade that all of our antibodies come from these streptomyces and what are they probably doing out there in the soil right with producing these antibiotics well they're probably talking to each other those antibiotics probably have other roles as well at different concentrations and they're using them to, to maybe control other populations as offense molecules but they're probably also using them to talk to each other as communication molecules. And so if we take that approach and say, okay, maybe if that's one of the roles that antibiotics have, let's find other molecules that other bacteria use to have that same kind of feature, right? What are the other bacteria who are not the streptomyces using to control their neighbors, to talk to their own friends? And maybe that becomes our next engine of discovery of the next generation of molecules that could be antibiotics or anti-cancer agents or what you will. Mm-hmm. I, I think for for people who keep hearing you know this this idea of like using nature and kind of learning from it to give like an, an example i think a lot of people would be able to you know like oh yeah i know about this is crispr came from person looking at these bacteria and how they interacted with each other like hey there's like this this thing going on here and they started delving into it as long as you know my memory is working right this is how they did that so it's like yeah they... no yeah you're absolutely right crispr was originally discovered even the name CRISPR, it stands for, it's almost a boring name if you think of the acronym. <laughs> it's a, given how important this particular, uh, uh, you know, mechanism is. And, you know, it's just this recognition that there was these repeat elements, repeat sequences that were routinely found in a lot of these bacterial genomes. And it was this really cool pattern recognition discovery that said, why might these be around? And then the elegant work that came out of it to show, hey, you know, this is actually a part of the bacterial immune system. What they're doing is, you know, much like our adaptive immune systems, they're keeping chunks of DNA of bad guys that invaded them, you know, bacterial viruses, phages, uh, and other type of things that might mess them up, you know, and they're, they're keeping copies of them so that now if they're ever encountered again, they can go and chop that DNA up. And so it was really cool. Yeah, you're right. You know, the we think of, or you know, where most people think of CRISPR right now is this cool genome editing tool and what it can do in mosquito populations and in humans and, and all sorts of cool things. But that particular application really came out of this original, you know, this this looking, initially gazing at genome sequences, figuring out the mechanism of why bacteria have them, and then appreciating the, the exquisite sensitivity that the that, that that cutting activity has, and then of course, as we all know, you know, people went to town, and people like you know Jennifer Downer and you know Amalia Chapantier and and George and and others have gone and really you know taken it and made this this incredible tool. It's like a this is like a silly comment I have, and I, I just like as a scientist who knows knows you know about this, I've always I'm like wondering if I'm the only person who's ever noticed this, but Doctor Duadna has anyone ever noticed that like. Her name is like, do you DNA? Like, and so like she, <laughs> she found something that messes with DNA. It's like, like, you know, like George Church is always perceived as like a, like a person who might be like a time traveler. But at the same time, like if someone were a time traveler and, and was like, Hey, I went back and was, I'm going to invent this in like a couple of years. Wouldn't you put your name like that? So like, it's like, a, like anyone who's paying attention, I don't know. It's like. It's like the weird thing I noticed, like her name. You know, I haven't says noticed that. that, but I think you know you should email her. But you know, I'd be surprised if someone hasn't told her that before. <laughs> that you know, she does have a 
uh, you know, a name that is sort of uh, aptly chosen, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, kind of set her on the right path. Though it is kind of funny, you know, we, we I don't know how much of this is just, I mean, I'm sure most of it is serendipity, but it's always fun to look at author lists of papers where people's last names are, you know, uh, you know, s suspiciously similar to the topic they're working on. Like there's a there's a the guy who works on you know gut gut ecology and microbiome work, and his last name is Gutman. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and I think there were yeah, there's I think there's some cheese microbiology person who's, who's yeah, there was someone on that list whose whose name had something to do with cheese. It may it even may have been Cheese Man. And you and you wonder what came first, right? Is this person sort of predestined to be like? Everyone has always called me the cheese guy, so I guess I should go work on cheese, right? Um, or, or is it just a coincidence? So, yeah, but I like the Doudna DNA thing. Last names like a really long time ago for commoners, like their last name would be their profession, you know, like Smith sure. or uh, Taylor. And so, yeah, we don't. Yeah, it's like a weird thing, but it happens. I, uh, it's like that one guy's name is like spot on for what he's working on. So there was another. And when it comes to like microbiome e ecology, I would you keep hearing these things about how. Or at least I do. I keep reading these things. And that, like, one thing is, like, if you eat yogurt, it helps your gut biome. And so, like, makes it so you're, le you, like, over a course of six weeks, they found that people who had yogurt, they were less anxious. Like, it did something to their gut biome. I, I don't remember the who did the research, so I don't know how valid that is. But then there's a another person in in Boston named Michael who, who there's, like, a, a, a link between our gut biome and aging and Alzheimer's and stuff. So it's, like... Like the ecology, uh, my, my, you know, people think, oh, it's just this thing, you know, maybe it's like, you know, arm's length, like, you know, keep the, the microbes away, like you said, but it's like our gut biome has a relationship to our mental states, which is like, just like this crazy thing. So I think like more and more people are going to like wake up and be like, I kind of have to pay attention to this. Like, it's no longer like this arm, arm's reach thing, but I'm, I'm curious, are there other things like that, that you've noticed that like, uh, that, that it, like if we can have a positive relationship with the ecology of our, our microbiome? Or like a... Absolutely. And, and I'll say that, you know, we're, we're most familiar with the gut, gut microbiome because that's where, you know, all of the early discovery work was done. Also, it's pretty easy to get poop samples in people. But actually, there's microbiomes on virtually all, you know, every part of our body, right? And so there's a skin microbiome, there's an oral microbiome, there's a vaginal microbiome. You know, and now it's almost, you know, it's, it's, it's be surprising to find a body habitat where there aren't microbes. And each of those microbes, uh, uh, at least the ones that are not causing us diseases, which is, again, the, the majority of them, have co-evolved. They've adapted with the human body and even that particular human body site uh, uh, to have these mutualistic r relationships, right? They're, they're there in the city benefiting from being there in that environment. That's the, They've got their own niches and they've got nutrition. But the human host is also absolutely getting a lot of benefit from it. And honestly, one of the cool things, and I think this is the one of the ones that is probably easiest to, to grasp just from an intuitive perspective, one of the major roles that the microbiome plays in every one of these habitats is to keep the bad pathogens, the bad bacteria out, right? Now, are they doing that because they're trying to be friends with us? Probably not. They're just doing it because they want to occupy the niche and they don't want to necessarily give it up. So they're competing the bad bugs out. But that's a huge benefit to, to human health, right? Effectively, you can think of our microbes as being both passive as well as active components of our immune system. The passive part is the fact that they're occupying these niches. But the active part is they're kind of keeping our immune system awake, right? Uh, they're, they're, you know, our immune system is, is, is being probed by them or, or vice versa is probing these microbes, recognizing them as self. And so then recognizing that it's something that it hasn't seen before is probably bad and, and you know, a, an invading pathogen so they can wipe them out. So that I think that's a really cool thing to appreciate about the microbes, again, gut microbes, as well as the others, that they serve these critical functions to keep the bad guys out. And then, as you mentioned, there's a whole host of other associations that people are now deeply beginning to investigate as to what other roles might they play, right? The, in a sense, the, as I said, the, the pathogen exclusion is, is a pretty intuitive, easy thing to understand. But what other cool things might our microbes be doing, especially because they're the best chemists we know, right? They're the best biochemists we know. They're making all of these cool molecules, but what are those molecules doing as they course through the human body? So as you mentioned, people are now investigating this thing called the gut-brain axis, 
right? So maybe there's something about the composition of the microbes in people's guts and spe specifically the activities they encode, the small molecules they make that can then interface with our nervous system, right? That can influence the way we think and the way we feel and the way we behave. So there's really cool work being done there. You know, another component of this is, and this relates back to some of our work with antibiotics, but you know, what, what happens when the, when the microbes modify chemicals we put in our bodies, right? So in the case of antibiotics, that's antibiotic resistance because they don't want to be killed. But what about a, a therapeutic for mental health, right? What happens if, you know, your microbiome is different from mine? We know that. Like, there are no two identical microbiomes. But what happens if your particular microbiome happens to have members that modify a particular, you know, neurological agent? Mine don't. And, you know, yours happen to potentiate that drug. Now you're going to respond better to that drug because your microbes have suddenly improved it. And then you can think of exactly the opposite outcome, right? The case where some particular bug in our gut happens to just have the apparent ability to degrade a particular drug. Now you can take as much of the drug as you want, but it's just going to be less effective in you because your microbes are doing something to it. So it's fascinating to know that we're effectively walking around with this malleable organ, which is, you know, just as important as our kidney or our heart or our brain. But it's a, an organ that, as I said, specifically is malleable, right? The, the whole group of microbes, they're, you know, they're interacting with the rest of the, uh, the environment. Some of them are coming in, some of them are going, but they're contributing significantly to probably, you know, all aspects of the human phenotype. And I think, you know, that's why it's kind of, it, it's a really heady time to be in microbial ecology because, uh, you, you know, there's a there's a new discovery to be made around every single corner and lots of cool new hypotheses to test out. And they help us understand some pretty basic things about, uh, you know, some fundamental things about microbial ecology, just, you know, from a pure science learning perspective. But virtually every one of those will probably also translate right into products that could help with our uh, with our health to fight against diseases. You alluded to you know, these probiotic activities, these good bugs that can be used and delivered into to, to humans to improve their health. And that's what the, the probiotic, uh, you know, sort of yogurt claims are. You've probably heard of fecal microbiota transplants, mm -hmm. right? And so th that's sort of the most egregious, <laughs> the most extreme version of a probiotic, right? literally taking someone else's entire fecal sample and putting it in you. And what's crazy is for this disease, this infectious disease called Clostridium difficile infection caused by the bug Clostridium difficile. Right now for severe CDI, the best treatment we have is literally taking someone else's fecal sample from a healthy state and putting it in you. And that's the best way to treat that disease. It's incredible, right? This is one of my favorite stories about clinical research is, you know, people were initially a little bit surprised, even though fecal transplant therapy is super old. I think the Chinese were doing it like 5,000 years ago for various ailments. But, you know, when people started thinking of using it for CDI, of course, the uh, a cry went out, okay, this is all anecdotal. What about a clinical trial? So then there was this amazing clinical trial that was set up in Europe, and they had to shut the trial down early, right? Why did they have to shut down the trial early? Because as they were tracking the placebo versus the fecal microbiota transplant, the FMT was so successful that in basically in real time, the IRB decided it is no longer ethical to randomize people into the placebo, right? What drug company wouldn't kill to have a finding like that, right? And what are we talking about? Just normal microbes and healthy people. And I think that's just super awesome. Talking to this person, any any they were working on putting tracking chips in people's hands. And we had like this debate about whether or not people would ever... He took to this extreme of like people will cut your hand off to get your, you know, your data. But I was just thinking like, what if like Lance Armstrong or like the Queen of England, who's probably gonna live to 150 years old, and they have like some special gut biome and like someone's like going out there and like trying to like steal their gut biome material, transplant into them so they can have the similar effects on their, their, uh, their body. I, I think maybe I, I read too much science fiction, but that's where my, my mind went. It's like, how can we optimize this? Because, you know, it's like, oh, this is like the base level. I always think like, how how high can we get it? And then you have like Lance Armstrong people who are, you know, or like I said, a Queen Elizabeth, who, who's very long lived, right? Like there's like her entire family is like, I think her mom and every every woman in her, in her family lived to like 100 or something like that. So, I mean, right. something special is going on there. Well, and, and so, so it's crazy that, I mean, I know you're calling it science fiction, but it's already happening. I think there are there are already companies 
that have been set up out there to say that they're going to sell you various type of celebrity microbiome cocktails, right? So this is not science fiction. It's already happened, right? The, the, one, of the one of the things that's happened with the proliferation of, of microbiome research and microbiome findings is, of course, people are trying to commercialize aspects of it. And it's completely across a spectrum of like absolutely kooky, hokey things going on that people are able to sell. Uh, through obviously very legitimate, you know, science-driven work. But yeah, people, you know, I think that's one of the things that we're going to have to be a little bit careful about with the microbiome, right? Right now, it, there's virtually nothing that is not associated with the microbiome, at least in someone's mind, right? So people are trying to figure out everything that could be attributed to the microbiome. And we need to just be a little bit careful with that to understand in which cases are those associations simply correlative versus in cases where they actually cause it. So, you know, there are sometimes you're going to find that just by random chance, if you look, you know, if you look for it sufficiently, if you roll the dice enough times, you'll be able to find that a particular human phenotype, you grab 10 people of phenotype A and 10 people of phenotype B, and you just by random chance might find that the, you know, the, the group A people have more similar microbiomes than group B. That doesn't mean that the microbiome now is the explaining variable of the phenotype in group A and group B, right? The, the associations might be purely correlative. So I think, of course, if those correlations exist, we should understand them and we should study them. The correlations might be diagnostic, if not, if not causative, but that's where we have to be a little bit careful about the slippery slope, right? So a great example is, right, just because you have a group of long-lived people doesn't mean that you can grab all the microbial samples and suddenly transplant into someone else and lo and behold, now they're going to be longer lived, right? It probably has to do more with the fact that there are also human genetics involved. But I think what we'll find is for many, many of these situations where we're trying to understand the human condition, that microbes will play some role, right? They may, they may, they, the, the relative contribution to that role will, of course, vary across various conditions. So, you know, it's much easier to, to intuitively appreciate that our microbes will contribute to our ability to, to digest various foods, right? The ones in our gut. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. There's, there's no real reason not to believe that, right? But there might be, you know, things that are stepping further and further and further away just to say, you know, oh, hey, you know, maybe, you know, look at all this group of smart people. Maybe part of their, you know, intellect is related to their microbiomes. I'm not sure. I think that starts, you know, stretching things out. In fact, I'm probably fairly sure that that's, uh, that's probably not a fair association. But if you, if someone manages to have a good enough marketing campaign, uh, they will certainly sell pretty much anything under the sun. And so I think there are companies out there, for instance, that are that are even selling, you know, microbiome products for your pets to improve your pet's health. Right. Obviously, with that case, you don't have to run any FDA trials. And so they could pretty much claim anything they want. So the, the question will become, you know, how much of that ends up becoming snake oil versus something that's legitimate and backed up by, by studies and science. Is there, are there things that you're concerned about, like other than, you know, people taking like maybe some pseudoscience and like a huge marketing campaigns and, and doing snake oil in the modern era? Do you, are there anything anything that concerns you? I know there's like, I hear a lot about this like antimicrobial resistance and how it's 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 gonna be a, like a, a critical. I, th I think people are already dying from it. Like um, they started dying from antimicrobial resistant related things like 20 years ago or something like that. But I'm just kind of curious. Like, what are from someone who's like kind of in in the field and you know you know probably reads about this stuff all the time. Like, are there? Do you have what what concerns do you have? Oh yeah, I mean certainly antibiotic resistance and the study of, you know, its evolution and the study of coming up with new antibiotics is, you know, bread and butter for our lab. It's the thing that probably we're most, most sort of scientifically passionate about trying to understand. And the stats are actually pretty scary. They're, they're much worse, actually, than the numbers you threw out. So, so we know that the tide of infectious disease uh, mortality turned around, you know, the early 1900s. And there was two things. It was better hygiene practices, and then the discovery of antibiotics, right? And so the, the first sort of, the first antimicrobial compounds were actually not even modern antibiotics. They were quite often, you know, heavy metals. So arsenic was used as an antibiotic kind of scarily. But then, you know, the lion's share of antibiotic discovery occurred in the, between the 1940s to the 1960s. Um, you know, penicillin being the first one that was found in the late 20s first used in the Second World War, you know, is credited with saving all sorts of lives there. 
And then, you know, there was this really nice trend of as new antibiotic classes were coming up, less and less people were dying of infectious agents, even though antibiotic resistance came up almost immediately after antibiotic use. But it was thought that basically, you know, we kept one step ahead of the game by coming up with new antibiotics. And then we had this catastrophic drop in new antibiotic discovery that happened after the 60s. Uh, and we literally had, you know, almost a 40-year gap before we found new classes again, but the bacteria didn't stop evolving. And so we are, we're at a, we're, you know, people have described it as, um, you know, we're, we're on the edge of a post-antibiotic era, uh, you know, almost an infectious disease apocalypse. And even though that seems hyperbolic, I mean, just think about the numbers. So right now it's estimated that you know, millions of people in the U.S. itself are infected with multidrug resistant organisms, and about a, you know twenty to twenty five thousand of them die from those drug resistant infections. That number balloons up to about seven hundred thousand or so around the planet. So people annually dying from drug resistant infections. And then there was this really, really uh, eye opening and scary report that came out of the U.K. Prime Minister's office, led by this guy Jim O'Neill, uh, a few years ago. And they said, okay, let's just take our current rates of antibiotic resistance and our current estimates of drug development pipelines and, and lots of other economic factors, and let's project what those numbers that I just told you will look by, say, 2050, right? So 35 years from when the study was done. And what the, the number that they came up with was that 700,000 deaths per year will blossom up to 10 million deaths around the, around the planet because of just drug-resistant infections by 2050. You put that number in perspective, that's one person dying every three seconds on the planet because of a drug-resistant infection, right? And the, the, the estimated cumulative hit to the global economy, if that actually came true, was $100 trillion, right? $100 trillion is the last six years of the U.S. GDP wiped out. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about small numbers here. So, but if that was to happen more people will die of infectious disease because of their drug resistance in 2050 than people will die of cancer. That's the scale we're talking about. And so that's why antibiotic resistance is something that is, is something that we're passionately interested in understanding and, and hopefully curbing. Because the, the silver lining in that report was those scary numbers that I just told you is if nothing changes. If we don't do a better job with being better stewards of our existing antibiotics, if we don't do a better job with surveillance. And so our lab is 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 really involved at you know multiple scales with saying, you know what, we need to try to be working on solutions to every one of those problems, right? We need to be working on solutions to understanding antibiotic resistance better. Again, using ecology and evolution to really understand what are the forces that allow antibiotic resistance genes to evolve, to move between strains, to get selected in the clinic. Uh, we also need to improve you know, our computational methods uh, that are able to very rapidly you know, search through sequences of organisms, of, of mixtures of organisms, like say microbiomes, where a good number of the microbes are good and only a tiny number are bad. And again, be able to very, very rapidly look through sequence data and say, okay, these are the bad guys, these are the resistance genes they have, and we'll use that information to actually make a therapeutic decision, right? And this is where, for instance, we're using some of the same techniques that some of your other guests have talked about, right? These artificial intelligence or machine learning approaches. I mean, really, when you drill them down to, into them, they're just they're statistical methods. They're looking for patterns. And so that's a lot of what our lab does. We look at fecal samples and samples of infectious agents from uh, lots of different types of habitats from from humans, uh, so adult humans and and kids, but also from the environment, from hospital surfaces, and then we collect as much data about that as possible, metadata as well as then in our case sequencing data, and then we use we go in and we try to look for specific patterns, patterns that are able to be predictive and patterns that will be diagnostic, right? So be able to say, okay, tomorrow now that we've done all this machine learning training on on observational data sets, tomorrow when a new patient comes in, maybe I can do a quick microbiome sequence on them and make inferences about, hey, what is the risk of this person responding poorly or well to this particular antibiotic? What is the likelihood of this person already having a, a, a drug-resistant organism in them, but if they get immune compromised, that can become now pathogenic? Uh, and then all the way from there to saying, okay, can we go even one step further and and be and, and try to make new types of therapies that can either 
improve existing antibiotics or even come up with antibiotic alternatives. And so, you know, I think you and I are talking because you talked to a couple of my grad students, uh, recent grad students who, you know, I started a comp- company with a couple of years ago to, to try to take one of these very, you know, serendipitous basic science dis- mm-hmm. discoveries and convert them into something that could be a newly, uh, a new improved antibiotic, right? And so in that particular case, this is a situation where through some screening, another graduate student in my lab happened to find and then really help understand that you could take three generic antibiotics, three drugs that had not been very effective on their own against fighting against one of these really bad pathogens called MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Mm -hmm. But when they were combined together, this triple antibiotic combination, suddenly they had these uh, really amazing abilities to not only kill the bug, but also suppress it from becoming antibiotic resistant. So that was a nice story of, of saying, you know, we spent all of these years trying to understand resistance from all of these different angles. Now we have a way in which to kind of pay back, right? To say, okay, our deep understanding of resistance in this case enabled us to find and explain how we could repurpose drugs. And, and now what Nick and Chris are doing now that they've graduated is, is take that to the next level, right? To actually take it out of the lab and, and, and run a company to try to you know, uh, make these, you know, cocktails, make sure that they're safe and make sure that they're efficacious. Uh, And it'll be just really cool to, you know, if this company then ends up succeeding to, you know, that that everything we talk about as scientists and what is our motivation? Oh, eventually we'd like to help humanity, right? We'd like to help something uh, that can be translated to some degree, even if that was not our original specific motivation. And so this this is our opportunity to do that. You know, and and then the, the so that's the more direct application of this towards existing drugs. But then the final thing that we have going on in the lab, or not final, but a, a, a different thing that we have going in the lab, which is also again inspired by microbial ecology and trying to fight uh, antibiotic resistance, uh, is directly using synthetic biology tools to engineer the next generation of probiotics. Actually, you brought up probiotics earlier. Uh, when you talked about the possibility that you know things that are naturally or added to yogurt could help with gut health, but we're trying to go one step further and say, well, what else could mm-hmm. we get good microbes to do? Right? Could mm-hmm. we have them deliver you know specific toxins to to pathogens? And so now you have a microbial delivery vehicle of a new type of antimicrobial in a way that can only kill the pathogen and doesn't you know hurt anything else. Could we even use these probiotics to just simply exclude the pathogen? Right? It's just a Kind of going back to the niche idea, right? So maybe all we need to do is say someone is about to uh, leave the U.S. to go to a high infectious disease burden area where they have a high likelihood of, of contracting a, a, a bug, an infection that uh, causes diarrhea, right? So now maybe one strategy is to say, hey, you know what? Maybe we can develop a probiotic that this person takes prophylactically, right? A, a, a good bug that they can just continuously take while they're out there. And that's just going to, you know, while they're, they're taking that probiotic, it's going to outcompete the pathogen even if it goes in. So, so those are a variety of different areas that we have, you know, footprints in, in our lab. Again, all of them really are informed by this microbial ecology perspective. And then, you know, can, can, can be motivated by basic science, can be enabled by the engineering tools, and then hopefully end up, you know, impacting this really, really important area of maintaining good, you know, sort of microbial health and fighting the, 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 the pathogens while minimizing damage to the good, good bugs. Uh, an observation, I suppose, is that I feel a lot of people my age, and I'm like about, I'm 26. So like a lot of my friends, they, they talk about wanting to do, you know, great things that want to like tackle like these, you know, him, like climb a mountain type things where like they, they conquer something. And they talk like, Oh, I don't know what to do, blah, 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 blah. I feel like to take like a positive out of like all these negative things like global warming, you know, antimicrobial resistance, you know, like it's like, it's a good time to be alive in the sense that there's a lot of problems that we get to work on. <laughs> um, Cause it's like, we get to handle these problems, you know, like if we rise to the challenge and, and we do good work, like, like yourselves, th- that 10 million figure won't happen. But so it leads me to the question what are for people who are listening in and they're 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 deeply concerned or they're deeply interested to learn more about microbial ecology and resistance and the and the type of work that you're doing what are the what are the are there like good places to go is there good pl- good ways to get involved you know like i always think like you get you get to learn through like these these dialogues with people about these interesting topics now like what can we do with it like what 
like right here i'm just thinking like hey how can i help you know in that type of situation sure. like, what can i do so i'm just very curious like where can people go to get be more literate on the subject and then with that literacy what can people do to be a part of the solution that's an excellent question right how do you how do you turn this information gathering into advocacy and into sense of of immediacy and urgency and i think there are a number of things that people can do across a spectrum of of involvement uh, I mean, one easy thing to do is listen to more podcasts like yours, right? I think there are lots of really good people out there who are interested in disseminating this information, and and that, that represents a diversity of perspectives. I think it's uh, it's really good when you have folks who are, you know, maybe not doing the day-to-day science, but are still really interested in the science and are educating themselves about it, like yourself, right? Who are then the bridge to to, to folks who you know, appreciating the, 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 the distilling that you've done and the background you've done. So, so I think that's, I think it's really good that we have that many more media opportunities to go and access this type of information than we had even 10 years ago, right? There are, you know, to learn more about the microbiome, there's a gazillion, you know, videos on YouTube. You know, some of them are at the TED Talk level, so you're really kind of listening to what someone is saying, but some of them are just the audio on top of you know various types of cartoons, other visuals. So those those are really really great places to start. I think science journalism is also steadily increasing across the spectrum because people are appreciating that you know science is not just this simply you know ivory tower uh, um, you know academic pursuit, but that has many many direct impacts on our lives. And so I think making that more accessible. Uh, makes even more people interested in supporting the endeavor. I think another really important part of science, and I think this is as much you know on the scientist side as well as you know the, the listeners, is to appreciate that getting training in science, getting uh, educated, getting degrees in science, is not only so that you can be a scientist, right? Something we, you know, I, I'm the director of one of our graduate programs here, and we're much more conscious now than say we were again 10 years ago about telling our prospective uh, PhD students, you are not getting a PhD so that you can climb the pyramid to become a professor, right? That is that is not the singular goal that most of you should have. The reason you should get a PhD, the reason you should consider the scientific method is because it makes you a better critical thinker. And that type of skill will make all of us better, right? It'll, it'll you know, and so we're hoping that the, the PhD students that we train go off and 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 participate in every aspect of of life and 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 you know all sorts of different professions. We we're hoping that many of our students will go and you know be entrepreneurs and be CEOs and at the same time be pub- public policy advocates. And some of them get into politics and some of them you know get into uh, um, you know other aspects that can uh, influence academia. And so. So I think you know one one thing that people can take away from this is if they're interested in this, they should encourage their kids and their kids and their friends' kids that 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 science is a is a valuable endeavor uh, not, with with not only being a scientist as the end goal, right? There are lots of cool things that can come out of being a scientist. And then from a practical level, right? When when you when say people are like, well, that's all great, Gautam, but what can I do about the antibiotic resistance problem? I'm not going to wait until my kids are PhDs, you know, 20 years from now. Well, there, there are there are some there are some obvious things that we can do. You know, we could we should learn uh, about the fact that you know uh, antibiotics are these sort of precious chemicals that, that every time we overuse them or misuse them, we are adding to the antibiotic resistance burden. So talk to your physicians. The next time you get sick, right, or next time your loved one gets sick, don't just demand an antibiotic. That's maybe something that in some cases is not just not going to help you. It's actually going to make things worse. Right. That's a hard thing to hear when you are trained to think, OK, my kid is coughing. I'm going to try to get an antibiotic for them. But you know what? Ninety nine point nine percent of the time, if your kid is coughing, they probably have a viral infection. Right. They don't have a bacterial infection and the antibiotics are not going to do any good. Now, I'm not a physician, so I'm not giving anyone any clinical advice. All I'm saying is talk to your physicians. Right. Don't demand the drug. Ask them if they think that the drug is going to be useful. So that's something that you on a very personal level can do. To say, you know, take, you know, be the advocate, right? By by living that particular part of advocacy, um, you know, when you go out, you know, when you make that decision, it's the same thing, right? Like the next time that you look at legislation that is that is brought up 
to consider the use of, say, antibiotics in meat production, right? Think about it. Look at the statistics. Do you think that's a good use of the antimicrobial resource, right? They're the same antibiotics that you and I will need if we get sick. Do we still want to use those antibiotics to make our meat a little bit cheaper? It's not something we have time to go into, but there's lots of good research out there. You can just you know look at you know look at antibiotic use in animals. Now, what's good is uh, again, this is one of those particular issues that people are beginning to realize compromise is the best way, right? When everyone gets to the table and talks to each other, that's always the best way to get to a solution. So it's not just a question of saying, okay, we think this is bad, we're going to ban all antibiotic use in animals, but rather go and educate and talk to the, 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 anim, the you know, animal rearers, right? And say, hey, wouldn't you prefer to have a solution where you don't have to buy large amounts of antibiotics and put in your feed and yet get productive animals? Let's come up with solutions together. And so again, this comes back to the microbiome and comes back to microbial ecology. There's some wonderful work being done in companies, startup companies, to maybe come up with animal probiotics, which will maintain the health of the animal, will, again, much like we talked about, try to stave off pathogens, and maybe in that case also then make the animals more productive. In, and in that case, now you've taken away the requirement for the antibiotics, and you can save the antibiotics for uh, you know, human use uh, when needed. So, so again, th th those are just a few different options, right? The, the educate yourselves, make sure that when you're making decisions about whether to take antibiotics or not, that you're consulting your physician and making an informed decision. And then also to contribute, if when you can, to the, the, the advocacy and the political process to say, you know, learn about this and make a decision by, you know, talking to the people with different views about should we use, in this very specific example, should we be using these particular really, really precious chemicals in wanton ways or in judicious ways? And you know, I mean, that was a rhetorical question based on the uh, <laughs> uh, way I phrased it. I certainly am a, a strong believer that we should be very, very careful with this precious resource. But I also do really strongly believe that we can only do that when we take the, the interests of all of the stakeholders into, into account. And one way then is to you know, help on both sides. I always look for new books or, or, or things to read, and I'm hoping you're a, a book reader or a resource reader, but is there, do you have like any nonfiction or fiction books that you'd recommend people check out that are either tied to what we've been talking about or, or that you enjoy? Yeah, I don't know if tied to what I'm talking about. You know, I think there are some really great books on the microbiome. Ed Yong has a book called I Contain Multitudes that is a really, really good job of uh, of, um, uh, uh, of describing the importance of the microbiome. But honestly, I get more fun from from fiction books. I, I know from, I think, maybe a question you asked one of your earlier folks on the program. I'm a huge, huge, huge Terry Pratchett fan. Very sad when he passed away. And so anyone who's not uh, uh, aware of the Discworld series should go fix that. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's just, it's a, I think it's it's cool the universe that he brings up. Um, and I just like the social commentary that it brings while still being in, in a sort of the fantasy um, another guy who is a is is more contemporary. I mean, who's, who's still writing? Who who again writes just just brilliant books that are on the sort of right on that cutting edge fiction and fantasy is Jasper Ford. You know, he he he's got one series which is called the, the Thursday Next Novel, which is really cool about a future in which you know humans can enter books. And 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 the main character is this woman who's a literary detective, and so she has to go in and <laughs> figure out how. Uh, uh, people are, you know, uh, uh, criminals who are jumping in and out of books in the real world, which is a really neat series. Um, but then he's also really got a really cool parallel series, uh, um, or, or I should say, it, it's going to be a series that's called. Uh, um, I forget what's. I think it's it's unfortunately a very very similar name to uh, what was that the, the shadow. Anyway, I, I, I'll email it to you if I remember, but. If people look up Jasper Ford, uh, he's got just an incredible imagination, uh, and it's it, it's it's nice escapism when you're feeling kind of bad about the world around you. Mm -hmm. the, the a note on the Discworld, the I I, I enjoyed the more, I'm I'm trying to explore them because he, he my God that guy's prolific when it comes when he came to writing, but the the moist moist mort moist the guy who moist um, unlip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That his series, like, so, ba like, pick up, like, basically, like, this con man has to reform the post office, and you, you right. would Going not. Postal is the name yeah, of that book. There you go. Uh, 
you would not think that that is an interesting topic it, it like that guy he make it's just a lot of fun like for for if people should check it out the another kind of fun thing about him is the the way the world talks about insurance like it's like this alien thing like er, insurance <laughs> Yeah, exactly. it's like uh yeah but for people listening it is, it is it is a lot of fun i haven't checked out jasper ford but it's now been added to my list i'll i'll check that no, out i strongly recommend i just actually looked it up well the, the the novel that i was recommending that's outside of this thursday next series is called shades of gray so uh and it's just a spectacular book it's dystopian so don't expect a fun ride here but uh it, it really it it's it, it's it's very topical because it has lots of of, of um uh, uh, parallels to kind of you know class and caste based segregation, but without giving anything away with the book, really the premise of the book is people are born into different colors, and that has nothing to do with the color of their skin. They just it's sort of their tribe. So the you know the reds and the blues and the greens, and depending on what color you're born into, that fixes what you can be and what kind of uh, role you play in society. And yeah, it's just exceptionally well crafted. Uh, and and again, if I was to draw a parallel to the Pratchett books, what I love about the Disc World is the Disc World is just a construction that allowed Pratchett to kind of, in a humorous fashion, comment about lots of parts about life right now, right? About love and war and uh, uh, and uh, and jingoism and things of that ilk. But you do it in this fantastical world, and so rather than picking on anyone right now, right? You talk about goblins versus elves right and so but but again like you don't have to look too far to realize oh wow he really is talking about issues that are exceptionally important to us but making us laugh and you know cry a little bit at the same time so so yeah strongly recommend uh, i mean there's lots of other you know i guess you know the one book i will recommend maybe uh that's a little science related i again has some science fiction aspects but uh, uh but i really like this author her name is connie willis she's won a whole bunch of hugo and nebula awards but the one that I recommend in particular, unfortunately, also kind of a sad book, but it's called the Doomsday Book. She wrote it uh, you know, many years ago, uh, but it has it has some time travel aspects. But that's you know, so the people who get scared by the science fiction aspects, don't worry about it. That's a you know, that's a, that's just a minor trope to help set the stage where the major character goes back to the plague, right? And the entire book is 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 based on effectively someone from our world or actually a slightly future world what would happen in terms of them going back to the plague in england and and you know uh, what does she learn about uh, what happens there um, so really 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 fascinating book um and and again the, again the science aspects are not quite as important as really the the kind of the the, the cultural commentary and also just the, the interpersonal interactions that I've described so, and that was Gotham Dantes. We this is one of the longest episodes I've ever done, but it was one of the most fun and enriching and interesting ones I've ever done. So I hope each and every one of you got something from this. I mean, we talked about celebrity cocktails, which you can just imagine what that is. The microbiome and how we're affecting it, bow ties, microbrewery, min maxine. I mean, you name it, we really kind of got into it when it comes to the microbiome ecology. We there are show notes if you want to like follow up with him, ask me questions. You know, really let me know if you like this type of content. You know, give me some feedback so I can keep keep making it more for you because I can I'm experimenting with this style if, you, if for longtime listeners of different ways to ask questions, you know, different ways to prepare. So all that kind of helps me and gives me feedback. You know, follow me at, on Twitter at Lowell was here, um, Facebook and all those things is just Lowell was here or Learning with Lowell. 